Thank you for having us. Um, my name is Ryan Green, and I am co-founder, along with Josh Larson, of an indie game studio called Numinous Games. Uh, Numinous is known for our emotional narrative projects. However, we also work in serious games, and now games accessibility. Yes, thank you. My name is Mike Perotto. Uh, I'm the development manager here at Numinous Games, and we're excited to share with you a new accessible games initiative focused on fun. And we're announcing this initiative for the first time here at Games for Change. We're also going to spend some time today talking about a few lessons we've learned as we've become intentional about designing for accessibility. Um, but before we begin, uh, we're going to talk about some happy things today and some hard things. And what I'm going to share next is emotionally difficult because it's a story of loss of a loved one. Um, and if today is just not a good day to dwell on loss, I'd invite you to come back and listen to this talk another day. Um, that's the beauty of a virtual festival. It allows us to consider the viewer as we broadcast our message over the internet. Okay, with that, I'd like to talk to you about Joel, uh, someone who I love to talk about. This is Joel. Uh, he had my heart from the day he was born. He is my third son, and when he turned one, he was diagnosed with a very rare brain cancer. Um, and Joel may not have grown old enough to change the world, but he certainly changed my world. His life was, was a force of gravity that pulled me and all who love him into his, or, his orbit. While the world around us spun madly on, Joel opened my eyes to the transformative power of caring for a child with special needs. Needs that plead with the world to slow down. Loving him demanded that I slow down too. Loving him demanded that I care. Love dictated it. Uh, Joel lived in a space where people are often afraid to look. But Joel's life turned us into people who refused to lurk, look away. Joel's fight with a terminal illness, vision impairment, motor impairment, seizures, significant hearing loss, paralysis, cognitive delay, speech impairment, and a host of specters that threatened his life awakened me to a world of Joel's, children who are all grappling with significant obstacles while facing uncertain futures. Sometimes I feel guilty that we didn't start a nonprofit to fight cancer. We know that there are many families who, like us, lost a child. These families look at the vast number of children impacted by the disease, and they dedicate their lives to raising money to fund treatment and research on behalf of the many. They impress us. We're in awe of them. Instead, at Numinous Games, um, to process our loss, we made art. We designed a video game honoring just one life, and how he changed us. And it's easy for us to wonder if that was the lesser choice. Should we have focused on the bigger picture? But sometimes thinking small has a big impact. It's because of our choice to love and design for the one, Joel, that I'm here to talk to you today. In the months after our video game, That Dragon Cancer was released, a health executive reached out to us. He'd read about our story in Wired Magazine and wondered if he might tell our story at a national conference his company was hosting for rare diseases. We agreed, happily. Then he asked us if we would like to create a project for neuroendocrine cancer community, and again, we happily agreed. Designing a game to honor one boy compelled one executive to ask us to serve many others with one disease. A few years later, this executive came to us again and asked if we could use games to serve another group, children with spinal muscular atrophy, a rare, debilitating, and degenerative disease that causes motor neuron death. Designing to honor one boy whose illness separated us from him led to being asked to serve thousands more children whose bodies keep them from the things they love, like play. Play was how we connected with Joel. We couldn't we couldn't connect to him in all the ways that we wanted to. He was nonverbal. Um, we wanted to know him. We would have give, given anything to connect with Joel in new ways through play. So we agreed again, happily. Loving the one, advocating for the one, and designing for the one so that we can all connect and draw closer together is how we change worlds. Today, I'm proud to announce an initiative that seeks to connect kids and their loved ones through play. We're calling it the Playability Initiative. The Playability Initiative has a funny name, but serious heart. This project will be a collaboration between Numinous Games, the Able Gamers Foundation, 
The Family Video Game Database and Games for Change in service to the spinal muscular atrophy community and beyond. Everything we're announcing today has been made possible by that one executive, his invitation to work with his team and the generous financial support of the company he works for, Avexis. Through the sponsorship of Avexis, this, ini this initiative seeks to collaborate with the community. Numinous will be collaborating with the SMA and broader disability communities to design a one button multiplayer adventure game for kids. What does that mean? It means it's a seriously fun game that can be played with a single button input. We're calling it Painted Waters, where adventure creates. For some children with spinal muscular atrophy, Painted Waters may be the first video game they play that was designed specifically with them in mind. Many games are adapted to players with special needs after the fact. And thanks to the leadership like of foundations like Able Gamers, whose mission is so everyone can game, kids and adults can connect to adaptive technology. We wanted to partner with them to not only bridge the gap between games and their players after a game has been created, but to consider all players in the design process from the very beginning. What if? Instead of oh, what if instead of starting with what the majority of players were capable of, we started with what a single player could if this one player could only move one finger? Could we make a game that's fun for everyone based on the abilities of that one? What if that same game helped players and their families learn more about the types of games and adaptive technology that were available to them? We'll be working with Able Gamers to design a special game mode that helps parents, caregivers, therapists, and educators assess what their child can do and point these adult advocates to adaptive technology best suited for their child's needs. The next aim of this initiative is to connect players with the games they'll love. Once players are connected to the adaptive technology best suited for them, they'll need games to play. When a parent of a child with a disability tries to find a suitable game for their child, it isn't as easy as looking for the E for everyone rating. Everyone usually doesn't mean their child. Everyone is not the one. Each child has unique abilities. Whereas the labeling that says what kind of manual dexterity is required for gameplay, how much rapid motor function is needed, whether or not eye tracking is supported. Finding an accessible game is not as simple as a label indicating a game compatible with adaptive technology. Parents need specific details relating to their unique child's abilities. This is why we've teamed up with Andy Robertson, a games journalist out of the UK who's an expert in family gaming. He work, his work encourages parents to meaningfully engage with their children through gaming by providing them resources and recommendations through his various popular social media channels. Andy's latest project, the Family Video Game Database, is growing into a treasure trove of curated game lists and powerful search features that connect adult advocates and their children with games they'll love. Numinous and Avex's sponsorship of the database will allow Andy and his team to provide new accessibility search filters that offer the kind of specific details parents can find for their children. The sponsorship will also empower Andy to add even more game profiles to the list so we can better serve players in the community and their particular needs. We're also build, building the Playability Initiative Adaptive Gaming Newsletter. This newsletter will highlight curate, curated lists and resources meant for advocates of our players so that they can discover new games and new adaptive technology trends for their kids. You can sign up now for this monthly newsletter at playabilityinitiative.com. Throughout the life of this initiative, while we as game designers learn how to serve our players, we will also seek to challenge inclusive designers of the future to consider individual players and their abilities. Numinous will be collaborating with Games for Change in this year's Student Design Challenge. Inclusive design is important across all issues, whether designing games to educate players on the issues that affect our environment, our society, our policies. Inclusive designers look for ways to draw all people into the conversation. Through the sponsorship of Avexis, Numinous will be working with Games for Change to create teaching materials that convey what we're learning as new inclusive designers. Through our own practice and through intentionally learning from experts in the field like the Emil Gabers Foundation. We look forward to collaborating with you and serving a community of players who will change the world through their play together, their empathy for each other and their creativity to imply, apply inclusive design thinking to all that they do. 
We'd like to thank Avexis for their generous support in this endeavor, and we look forward to sharing more with you in the year to come. In the last half of this talk, we'd like to share with you some of what we're learning as newly minted inclusive designers. We wanna show you what happened when we asked ourselves, what if we start designing for one player and their abilities? First of all, we're not experts in the inclusive design yet. Our industry is seeing encouraging growth in accessibility, most notably with the wealth of accessibility features included in the blockbuster game, The Last of Us 2. But accessibility in games has a long way to go. For change to occur, small developers like ourselves and large developers need to start considering all of their players when designing games. We expect to fail, we expect to learn, we're listening, and we're committing to sharing that journey with you. Today, we'd like to share a little bit about what our team is learning while designing for the one. In our case, that means folks like my friend Zach, who hasn't played games for years, and the children we've met working in this initiative, um, some who can't breathe without a trach, some who can only slightly move their fingers, some who play with their eyes. The first design tip I wanna share with you is to encourage you to find the one to design for. Parents, therapists, and educators are all evaluating our games with a particular player in mind, and that player has a name. This is Zach. He writes children's books. When I was first starting discovery work on this initiative last year, I thought, hey, this guy that comes into the local coffee shop I visit has cerebral palsy and writes children's books about kids with disabilities. Maybe he'd be a potential collaborator. After introducing myself, however, Zach and his aide John became fast friends. And we spent many hours over the last year talking about family and films, the stuff that ticks Zach off and the stuff that makes him happy and his ambition as a creative. I asked Zach early on if he played video games. He said he didn't. He used to play, but when he found out that his controller wasn't really controlling the games he thought he was playing, he stopped. He hadn't played in over a decade. I asked him, hey, if I made a game for you, would you be willing to try it out? I have this sweet new Xbox adaptive controller and I make games. He readily agreed. And he told me he used to like downhill skiing and playing ice hockey when he was growing up. But even in those real life sports, he faced the same frustration of a lack of autonomy. He didn't have as much control as the people helping him did. So in my free time while working on this initiative, I also made a two button air hockey game and a downhill skiing prototype. Now, I'd love to say that these tests went perfectly and Zach was able to cruise elegantly downhill on his new virtual skis and our fast paced hockey game was nail biting to the end, but that's not how it went. The prototypes were buggy and as a novice inclusive designer, my implementation was flawed. But what I remember most is the smile on Zach's face. He'd been reintroduced to gaming, games built for him to play, and I'd made a new friend a ready collaborator who could bring his writing to life in new ways in the games that we could make together. We've since been conspiring on new gaming ideas and I look forward to Zach's collaboration. Through working on prototypes for Zach and prototypes for kids with spinal muscular atrophy, I learned something pretty obvious, but it probably needs to still be said. Designing for adaptive technology doesn't automatically make a game accessible. In this early prototype, I had designed a digital instrument for kids to play. Uh, moving a joystick around in eight directions allowed kids to play music by hitting notes. I focused on adapting uh, joystick movement, patting myself on the back for allowing the player to interact with touch, adaptable joysticks, and eye gaze control. However, I had neglected the one button players by only giving them the ability to tell the animals to sing. Some of my players could compose, compose beautiful jazzy riffs uh, with their joysticks, but some of my players could only conduct the choir by pressing start and stop. This leads me to our next design tip. Examine your inherited ability bias. Many of our favorite fighting, shooter, driving, and platforming games are less about play and more about mastering difficult interfaces with dexterity. They're hand puzzles for the most dexterous among us. With players who can do this, it's no wonder I can never last more than a few minutes in Fortnite. Knowing I needed to avoid the trap of designing for dexterity, I focused on simple controls. I researched adaptive technology, special ordering custom 3D printed joysticks, 
but I brought my own inherited bias as well. By designing for joystick-based movement, here you see in my playtest, some players were, navigate the joy were able to navigate the joystick and touchpad to make the unicorn draw pictures in the pond. But for my eye-tracked player, I had neglected to support gaze-only input since they couldn't see any, since they couldn't use any of the fancy switches I had bought. They couldn't look and press a button like the game required. Likewise, players who could use a one-switch setup weren't able to move as freely as their joystick-powered peers. Our assumptions about most players being able to play neglected the one player who plays with a single button. Thankfully, Numinous recently hired another talented designer who recently evaluated our early pro prototypes. His name is Hayden, and he had the following observation. Prioritizing joystick movement makes using adaptive input tedious and annoying. Hayden isn't one to mince words. <laughs> and so he recommended we pause our design with our mountain of ideas, mechanics, and themes for this new game we're making and asked us the following question. What does the player want to do and what is preventing him from doing it? We decided to zero in on the movement problem. If some players are able to play with, a, with only a single switch, do we care about their play experience? If we do, then is joystick-based movement really a core value for our game? What will players want to do and what is preventing them from doing it? When we focus on the, what most players could do, instead of focusing on one player, we mourn our, our losses when we can't use the flashy end of the controller. Um, but when we focus on the one, we create a gift for them that isn't about us as designers at all. And when we do it well, it serves everyone. Hayden introduced us to some new references and explored new ideas on how to design our maps. What would happen if we allowed players to focus on their desired destination rather than just their next step? We looked at bus routes and footpaths. We thought about planning paths by bouncing characters around an environment or using line of sight to determine the next destination based on eight cardinal directions. When we thought about it, we realized that we don't plan our steps in real life. We plan our destinations. And for many of us, our movement is as involuntary as a heartbeat. Why do we value joystick movement so much in our games? Sometimes they just get in the way. As we prototyped, we started building off of each other's ideas. Well, what if we could let go of our expectation that freeform movement is the best for everyone? What would grid movement look like? How many options could we offer at any given time? What if we moved on the outlines of the grid rather than from the center of the spaces? In this first example, every time the sphere changes direction, the player has hit their button. This led to some very fast and fun movement that didn't require the player to press a button at every junction of the map. In this second example, uh, collecting items wouldn't require players to press multiple buttons. As they move, collecting items could be as easy as encircling them. When your player avatar is a bug who always tends to turn left, collecting an item uh, is as simple as pointing the bug in the right direction, or in this case, the left direction. With only one decision, left or right, players could navigate the entire map efficiently. These prototypes led us to the conclusion that semi- We take autonomous vehicles for granted all the time in our daily lives, from auto steering cars to riding in taxis and riding on scooters to taking the time to torment robo vacuums. Total control does not necessarily equal fun. When we really looked at our grids, we realized the shape of the paths between the points didn't really matter, so we bent them into fun shapes. We also realized if you're not driving the car, in this case, the orange ball as it drives along the path, Maybe the fun could be found in chasing cars. In this first example, the small white sphere follows the orange car. While the player is pressing the button, the player stops following the car. When they press it again, the player's sphere follows once more. We realized the fun was trying to capture the big spheres in the middle by anticipating the new path they'll take when they choose to begin following the car again. In the second, 
We added intersections. Press the button to take a turn at the intersection, follow or don't follow the car when it's outside of the intersection. In the third, I channeled one of my favorite activities growing up, kneeboarding. The players pressing the button to use their momentum to swing wildly around corners or pressing the button to follow peacefully, all without controlling the steering of the vehicle. This led to the final prototype we're going to show you today, mini golf. We realized the fun in this space between is in between the paths, not following the path itself. In these prototypes, one button tap breathes in deeply. The next button blows out the little bug who's serving as the golf ball in the direction of the hole. We discovered a prototype that was challenging and fun for all players and all playable with one button. This leads us back to Hayden's original challenge to us. Instead of dwelling on player movement, he challenged us to find the fun. We'll leave you with this. My bias could only be confronted by knowing the players that I'm serving and designing for them uh, instead of me to meet my goals. Um, by gathering a team willing and able to challenge assumptions, we continue to uncover design bias together. As one of the co-founders of Numinous, I recognize we have a long way to go as we seek new collaborators, listen, learn, and practice inclusive design. Loving Joel gave me new eyes to see beyond my own world. And to no one's surprise, the new friends we're meeting as we venture out on this new journey are worthy of consideration too. Love dictates it. Thank you.